On today's Bike Camp and Chill podcast, we're initiating a brand new series, The Starter Pack. This is all for beginners, anybody and everybody that's interested in bike camping, bike packing, and just touring on bikes, exploring, adventuring, having fun. I'm joined by Michael Roderick, owner and chief bike mechanic at Bandon Bicycle Works, as well as Al House, organizer for the Coos Curry Adventure Cycling Club. All of us have differing opinions, perspectives, and experiences, and we're going to share the bicycle rigs that we use for our trips so that we can just throw around some ideas and give those of you that are interested in maybe picking a bike or even using the bike that you have on why you would use different wheel sizes, tire sizes, frame materials. There's a lot of information here. So this is split into a two-parter. Ultimately, we just want to show others that it doesn't have to be a crazy, challenging ride. You don't have to be athletic. There's bike setups for every sort of scenario. So let's jump into this discussion and get started with our first starter pack. Hell yeah. Pedal up that hill. It'll be worth the thrill If you got the power of will To bike and camp and chill To bike and camp and chill uh, The beer I have today is a McKinsey Brewing. So this is here in Eugene. But this one stood out to me because look at this name. Tree Licking Maple Porter. Nice. I know you like the darker beers, so. I'm a, I got maybe shop coat, so I'm in the, uh, the Rogue Honey Mamas or Santa there. Oh, yeah. I think that might have been the one that I, I took with me um, when we were doing the Eden Ridge ride. It's the one that says it's like chocolate and tahini and yep. all that. Pretty interesting. Based off a of stout, so I'm in. So, well, cheers, cheers. I got good old um, Knob Creek whiskey. Knob Creek. Yep. Dirty pirate whiskey. Well, on the last podcast episode, we talked about why we love adventure cycling, defined it a little bit, and we're going to start on the starter pack today. This will be the first episode in the series, the first category, the most important one. What kind of bikepacking bike are you going to use? We'll talk about um, some of our past experiences, the bikes that we've used, maybe our reasonings on why we've used those bikes or the current bike that uh, we have set up. Uh, then we can talk a bit about why you might go with a different style of bike, maybe leaning towards gravel or more of a mountain bike setup. Um, you know, what kind of handlebars you got, the drop bars, you got flat bars. I think when somebody is getting into this, or interested in getting a bike, there are many things they need to think about. And some of it might be a little overwhelming. They don't know where to start. That does start to seem like there's a lot of options. And so we can kind of talk about our experiences, the things that we've tried, why we've landed where we are, and just talking about what a good starting point would be, especially if you don't know where to start. Um, I think we can talk about it does depend on what you might mostly be riding. But if you just need a starting point, there are some great options out there as far as stock bikes and ones that don't have to be really expensive either. I think we're all about finding ways to save money and use multi-purpose gear and getting, but at the same time, getting stuff that's quality. You want it to last. You want it to really be able to be uh, capable when you do an adventure. So those are all things you're going to think about. So I guess I'll start off with my personal experience. When I started looking at a bike packing bike, this was probably in 2016 time frame. I used to commute a lot on a mountain bike, uh, specialized hard rock, and that worked quite well down in the Bay Area for everything I needed it to do. But I wasn't really doing these long overnight camping trips. Once I started looking more into that, I actually landed on the Marin Pine Mountain, which is a steel hardtail bike that's geared towards bike packing. It has a lot of mounting options. Um, it's also a plus bike, or it comes stock with plus tires. It has clearance for that. And at the time, 
when I thought about what bike I wanted, I would see a lot of these plus bikes and you see them as something that can ride all sorts of terrain. You would see people biking in sand and snow. And yeah, there's fat bikes out there that can do that. But it seemed like something that, you know, was kind of in between a standard bike and a fat bike. And maybe you don't want a full on fat bike, but having just the plus tires kind of seemed like it'd be capable of riding all sorts of different conditions and stuff. So I think that's kind of where I landed. I wanted something that leaned a little bit mountain bike. Um, that's what I was used to. It had front suspension. It seemed uh, compatible with any future updates I might want to do as I got familiar. And it was in the $1,000 price range that I was looking for. I rode that for a few years. And then just recently, uh, that bike was retired. And then I actually landed on a used Salsa Fargo. And I'm really liking this bike. It's fully compatible with any future things I'd want to do. If anyone looks at the specs on that, um, it can fit different tire sizes, different wheel sizes. It comes with drop bars, but I converted it to these curved flat bars. And really, I just wanted a bike that could pretty much do anything that I want it to, ride anything I come across. And so really, I think when somebody's looking at a bike for this kind of stuff, yeah, it really depends on what you're going to be riding most of the time. But if you really want an adventure bike, I think that's kind of what you're looking for is like a Jeep of bikes in a way, like something that's going to be capable of uh, whatever terrain you end up trying to take it on an adventure with. Well, bike packing bikes, terrain bikes. I started off with a Surly disc trucker, um, 700C, but I put like a 50 millimeter kind of all terrain style tire and a riser handlebar, kind of mountain bike drivetrain, uh, um, two by mountain bike drivetrain. And uh, started off doing like road stuff, road kind of bike touring things. And uh, soon went to the trail and moved off into a um uh surly ogre which i actually started off with a drop bar when i first built it and then went right back to a mountain bike handlebar. bar but it was a 29er 2.5 um and that was always kind of until today been my um kind of sweet spot like a 29er rigid with a 2.4 ish tire um i like it because it's um it's mountain bike enough to handle going on mountain bike trails and off-road situations, but it's still not super aggressive and being rigid and a narrower tire on, you know, the bike packing spectrum of plus sizes and fat tires and stuff. So it's fast. Um, and the reality of it, most of our bike packing where we live now is um, a ton of gravel road riding, road riding, gravel road riding, um, double track and single track trail. So I wanted a bike that was still fast. I like bikes that have big triangles in them to put big frame bags. You know, some mountain bikes and stuff that are meant for suspension have smaller triangles. And uh, so I specifically look for a rigid style mountain bike. Um, the current bike I ride right now is a 20 plus year old Surly Karate Monkey, original year Surly Karate Monkey, 29 or rigid. Uh, it's got a one by 12 Eagle, um, full frame bag riser bar fast it's aggressive it's comfortable um it's probably one of the coolest bikes i've ever owned and it was sort of built by me buying a frame from a from a customer and piecing it together with what i had in my uh in my garage and in my back room when you bought that uh surly karate monkey did you land on it i guess part of it was you came across somebody that was selling one but at the same time when you were looking at it do you automatically investigate, like, is this thing going to be capable of any future updates I might want to do with it or like it com being compatible with? Not necessarily. So on my previous bike, so I, I, you know, I've been in the bike shop world for a long time. So I'm temp I'm typically like most bike mechanics. I'm going to buy a Surly because I can get it cheap on QBP. And so I always had the idea before I want a bike that I could do racks. I can do different multi different hubs and and uh, all this different stuff. Right. But through the years of um, my bikepacking experiences, I don't need a lot of stuff. I run a frame bag. I run a tail bag. I run a handlebar bag. Um, I don't really need rack mounts or fender mounts or anything like that. I always wanted an original generation Surly Karate Monkey for the geometry. It kind of has a dropped front end and a non-suspension corrected fork 
and it's just kind of old school it's got just quick release nine millimeter quick release you know skewer hub spacing and looks kind of old like small round Kamali tubing and i always wanted one um never really went super hard after looking for one and i had a customer walk in one day and was like hey i need to get my bike fixed up and it was a surly karate monkey and i was like trying to buy it off him and he want to sell the time and i told him if you ever want to sell it to me you know if you're ever, if you're ever gonna get rid of this bike hit me up first i'll, I'll buy it and uh probably a year later or something came my direction and i've been riding ever since that's awesome so i probably lean a little bit towards the mountain bike side of bike camping bikes but i started on the on a 700c touring kind of bikes yep and i guess what i should add as far as my experience is i was used to always picking a mountain bike to ride again i commuted on a mountain bike and i rode a lot of pavement but i always had this idea of wanting a bike that would be able to ride anything I came across if I hit some trail or hit some gravel. And so a lot of times that meant, you know, a hardtail front suspension. And now I've learned over these last couple of years going fully rigid and trying that out, how capable a fully rigid bike can be and how much it can still feel like a mountain bike, especially when you have wider tires. I've ridden that thing on very technical mountain bike trails. And I've even had buddies tell me, man, you're actually look more confident on that thing now because you really have to pick your lines and yeah. And, and but it actually doesn't I think feel people feel like it would be so rough. And yeah, if you're doing some, you know, there's definitely some stuff that you'd be riding a full suspension bike if it's technical single track all day, something like that. But when you're doing more cross country flowy stuff and especially when it's just a part of your ride, I've definitely been surprised at how much I didn't miss having front suspension. Yeah. Now riding rigid bikes, um I think in bike packing or touring bike world or just adventure cycling you know in general is probably better your bike has less maintenance you got less you know things going on um you can typically ride in adventure cycling in in adventure cycling situations you're typically pedaling your bike not just bombing downhill right so um but i grew up riding bmx bikes so we always call the suspension bike like a squishy bike you know and so the rigid bike feels at home for me. Um, bigger tires definitely help out. Uh, it, I definitely agree with Dallas that it makes you a better rider. With a suspension bike, I could just, you know, let it soak it up, bomb it, let it hit a bump, let it soak it up and keep going. The rigid bike, I'm constantly, when we're bombing hills, looking for the line, you know, trying to find your line to go as smooth as possible. But um, on rigid bikes, we go on these long downhills you know, seven, eight, nine mile downhills. And we say what we call brakes for brakes, which is a combination of taking a break so your brakes can cool down. But also, I mean, your hands are getting jarred up from yeah. just bombing super gravelly stuff for eight miles. Yeah. And your posture is going to be a little different, I think, too. When you're bombing downhill, especially when it's a good 10 miles straight because you just went up a huge mountain and now you're doing the full descent. Uh, when you're doing fully rigid, I feel like for one, when you're descending, you're not sitting on, on the saddle. So you usually have that out of the way. Um, but the way I feel like, you know, you're definitely going to hold on tight. You don't want to fly off, but you're also going to kind of be loose in your, you know, in your knees and everything so that you're kind of, your body's kind of fluid as you're hitting stuff. Right. So it's not just sh a shock to your system or anything. That's one thing I like about my bike too, uh, being a fully chromoly frame and fork. And I also have a custom chromoly riser handlebar. The bike has a lot of like give in it. It's not enough give that it takes away while you're pedaling, but I, it has a softness to it. So it's not as bad as having like a, uh, you know, a carbon or aluminum frame or something like that. Yep. So Al, what I want to ask you, we, we did talk in an earlier podcast about your surly karate monkey as well, which we know you're currently riding. I'd be curious because I know there was some, road touring you did back in the day right so what what did that look like you know because we're we're still talking about having road bikes and doing some more paved road touring and bike packing in that sense that's totally an option for people as well it doesn't always have to be this mixed terrain that that is more common with what we're talking about but i know again you first started doing just full-on road touring and that style of adventure cycling um so i was just curious what your first couple of bikes in that category looked like? I, I think I like, um, like most people is I kind of just 
went out and found a bike that I wanted to get comfortable on and ride. And then I adapted that bike to what I wanted to do. I didn't really specifically say, this is what I'm going to do. That What's the best bike for that? So um, I've toured on more upright, um, a Trek 2300. Uh, I toured on that. And that is a carbon frame bike, not designed to carry any weight, really. So that was more of a supported ride. So I didn't have bags on that one. I toured on, uh, I did rag bry on that. So that was a supported ride. Uh, I also had a Da Vinci tandem and it's set up in an upright manner, like a mountain bike, flat bar mountain bike. And um, I toured with that, but we carried a Bob trailer. So I had, you know, extra handlebar bags, a rack on the back, mostly to play music. Uh, but everything else fit in the Bob trailer. And that was not hardcore touring as you know, multi days. Other, you know, it, was, it was like the Oregon coast. So it was multiple days, but it was uh, plan A to B, uh, camp out, B to C, sleep in the inn, you know, do some laundry. And it was not quite end to end, but close. And I really didn't expect to be bike camping. I didn't really have that kind of that thought process. Um, I just bought a bike that was felt bulletproof, comfortable. It didn't look fragile, didn't feel fragile. Uh, and I get to sit upright in a comfortable position because if I'm comfortable on the bike, I know I'm going to ride it more. I know um, I don't have to worry about the bike. I can just worry about the situation. I don't have the bike skills of a BMXer or somebody who does a lot of mountain bike uh, trails. So when it gets technical, you know, I get really slow and I hope to get back on the trail because I'm off it more times than I would like to, to say. Yeah, but Al makes up for it being like a cat because I've watched him literally on one ride uh, go over the handlebars like three or four times and land on his feet every time. When you get old, you don't want to land anywhere but on your feet. Uh, that's a bad day. So um, I, I'm not afraid to, to go past my limits. That's where you define where, where they're at. But um, like I said, I was looking for an upright, comfortable bike. And the Karate Monkey fit that. And I then learned after I had that bike what back bike camping was about and what all those mount points were for, you know, uh, and I've still not used them all yet. And I'm just trying to find different ways. I don't think I've gone on the same bike. I don't think I've packed it the same twice in a year and a half of doing this. Um, so every time I go out, it's a learning experience. Where Where's the weight on the bike? Where do I want to put it? That kind of stuff. So it's a, a rigid karate monkey that makes sense for me yeah and it it seems like you've been you've been liking it you're you're trying different things you're you're learning optimal setup and i know you're also one change you are making to it which might lead into one of the next topics here when we talk about tires and wheel sizes is so that i, I believe that came stock as a 650b or 27 and a half wheel size and you're actually thinking about switching it to 700 or 29 inch right so i mean um it, that's really the exploration part of what feels right for you where we live and where we ride mostly is we get some pavement and that pavement has gravel on it for because everyone dirt driveway you go by has dirt roads and gravel gets spilled in your your bike lane so it's not really smooth pavement so much it has gravel roads that are sometimes smoother than the asphalt and sometimes more potholes than road. And then we get some trails, single double track trails. We have the um, opportunity to ride some very technical trails, but usually when we're bike camping, um, that's a very tiny segment, if at all, as, as part of that. So I'm not so worried about that. So I, it came stock with uh, 27 fives and it had a three inch, very aggressive, almost motorcycle looking tire that just screamed on the pavement and it was very heavy and hard to pedal. If I went to the trails, it was probably the perfect tire, but that's not where I was riding. So then I went to the other extreme to a 2.75 extraterrestrial um, Surly tire. And it was, it's a big balloon. It was, it was very, very comfortable. It was soft. Um, it had almost no real grippy knobby thread tread on it. And it was fast on the roads. Uh, it did get sketchy when I got into some looser gravel because it didn't really have any grip. 
So then I have swapped again to a tire that has some grip on the side, some pretty good size knobs on the sides. It's a Maxxis, and it has a pretty good rolling, uh, knobby rolling centerpiece too. So it seems to be my average tire now, and I'm down to about a 2.35, I think, um, which is a good, comfortable fit for me. I just want to try um, smoothing out some of those bumps by going to a 29 versus a 27.5. Yeah, what I would say when I was looking at my bike setup back when I got the Marin, it came stock with 27.5s that were 2.8 inches wide. And again, that was plus. And I think at the time, you know, you're told that can add some cushioning when you're go, especially if you go fully rigid, um, you get, you have more surface area, probably more traction when you're doing sand and things like that. But over time I've seen like, oh, you don't necessarily, you know, some of that could be overkill. I've been surprised at actually how narrow of tire I couldn't ride even through sand and stuff. And the one thing I remember learning is with a 27 and a half inch with the 2.8 inch width, that's almost equivalent to if you went like a 29 by like a 2.2 or something like that. And so the overall diameter can be similar, uh, which can help with the momentum and getting over things. Um, but right now I've landed on a 29 by 2.5 inch Terravale A-line tire. And I really like that one. Cause it's like, it seems like really fast, uh, moving on pavement stuff, but just enough knobs here and there when you need it. And I've been able to ride that in sand, snow, but it's also quick on pavement. So Mike, I'd be curious, like what, what do you usually say when you're comparing the two different types of wheel set and sizes? Um, well, in my own personal experience, the bike I had just before the bike I have now, my bike now is a 29, 2.35 on a 30 millimeter rim. Um, so some might say that's like a cross country kind of size mountain bike tire. Um, my bike before this was a 27.5, 35 millimeter rim and a 2.5 tire. And I feel like my new bike is faster and easier to ride. Um, combination of the geometry of the bike but all the parts i mean the handlebars you know all the drivetrains the same stuff i swapped it all over to this new frame but on the 29s i feel like the bike's easier i feel like i'm faster um but i would say you know a real easy way to put it is this you can put a in most mountain bikes you can put a 27.5 with a bigger tire or a 29 with a little smaller tire so if you want to get real aggressive on some crazy downhill, right? It'd be nice to have the bigger tires. At the same time, when you watch downhill mountain bike races, they don't have bit plus size tires. They have more of a traditional mountain bike size tire. So if you want to get real soft sand, uh, loose stuff, you know, tons of single track trail, very bumpy and, and uh, you know, just rooty or whatever, you, you would probably like to have the 27.5 with a bigger tire. If you're doing what we're doing mostly out here, which is just a ton of gravel road riding, uh, smoother, you know, most of the single track is smoother than other places. Um, the 29 is fast. It's a fast rolling tire. Just about everybody that we ride with, except for Al, is on 29s. And Al's on 27.5. And everybody kind of does the same pace. So it doesn't feel like in our group that somebody has a faster or a slower tire um because of the size of it and i think sometimes is it true that people will go with a 27.5 maybe if they have a smaller frame or a smaller body type and and also if you want the bike to be more uh agile and things like that yeah exactly um on smaller riders you know if you put like a if you look at like a 29 or wheels wheeled bike on like an extra small frame it doesn't even look right no. right and there's major toe overlap issues on them um, where your toes will hit the front tire. And you could make a bike smaller by doing a smaller frame and smaller wheel sizes. So if you're a very short rider and you don't want to be on a kid's bike or a 24 or something, you can get into an extra small bike with a 27.5, right? Or this, well, you know, a smaller tire and have like a proportionally right bike. Um, and, you know, on the mountain biker side of it, where you see a lot of 27.5 and 29, um, bigger tires, 27.5 is easier to fit bigger tires. And you can have a more nimble bike, the wheels smaller, uh, your bike's typically a little shorter. So 
But I think it really comes down to how you feel. You could uh, feel good on both. I've ridden both tires on just about everything that we ride. I've, um, I'm really happy with the 27.5s, but I uh, also own a bike with 29s, and I like that bike and the way it responds as well. Uh, totally different bike. I can't expect the Karate Monkey to perform like that one on 29s, but I'm going to give it a shot. I mean, I might even experiment with going from uh, a 27.5 to 29 and maybe even swapping out the front tire and going to a mullet configuration too, just to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Because we get a lot of terms that all these great cyclists throw out at us uh, that it doesn't make any sense unless you actually experience it. And I'll just, Michael talked about toe overlap. That's a really easy one to experience fast and learn it forever because you're laying in the parking lot trying to figure out why your bike stopped and uh, you just fall over, you know? Um, yeah. So. I was worried about toe overlap on my, uh, I have a um, Black Mountain Cycles Monster Cross, Cycle Cross kind of style bike. And it's the only bike I have with clipless on it. And my toe, when I'm clipped in, crank forward, the tire, I mean, it clears by like, an eighth of an inch. Yeah. I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. Okay. If it doesn't clear, you end up laying in the parking lot. <laughs> just that front yeah. wheel just stops and you fall over. I've done it not once, but twice. And uh, I'm probably more afraid of that than cars. Well, I guess at this point, we've talked about wheels and tires. And I would say between the three of us, it sounds like we've all tried and ridden 27 fives. And we're saying, those work great. They can work great for you. It kind of depends on what you're doing. But at the same time, we've all gravitated towards 29s and 700s. And that's that goes with our um, bikepacking mountain bikes and also our road bikes as well. So we're kind of showing across the spectrum that that's kind of where we've landed. It can be quicker across most things, um, but it, it, it does kind of depend. So that's just, uh, you know, across the three of us, kind of where we've landed. So I think that, you know, can show people, you know, if they're getting a stock bike, we both got a stock bike that came with 27.5s and that worked for us and we got familiar with it and then went from there. So it's not like, you know, there's anything bad between the two, but there is a different feel in the, in the ride when you have those different sizes. I might switch to these 29s. And uh, the ride might be different enough that I'm not comfortable on the bike any longer. And then I'm, I'll go back to the 27.5s. To me, it's about the comfort and the feel of the bike. Do I feel comfortable on the bike? Uh, what, I, what I suggested to Al was you put your 29ers on there. You're going like, to love them. And then your 27.5s, we put those 3.0 tires back on it. And you got your beach bike. I'm going to go do a beach tour down to Port Orford. Yeah, so that is a good point. That's something that I've thought about. I mean, it's not necessarily, you know, it is. it can be more expensive for most people. But in the long term, if you got 27.5s to start and then later you get 29 wheels, it is the option where you could have both wheel sets and you swap between them. Um, I mean, that you don't need two bikes at that point. That's a really common um, thing that we talk about in the bike shop that people ask about or they might want to do something like that. So I think that'd be great to talk about for a second. Um, most people that are going down this route going, well, I have one, I have a bike and, you know, like, Al, I have a 27.5 and I want to put a 29 on it. I'm probably going to keep my 27.5s. I can swap them out back and forth, right? Yeah, you can. Um, most people think I'm going to put two rotors, two cassettes, two wheels. I'm just going to swap them in and out. That doesn't necessarily work that way. Um, your chain wears to your cassette. And when you take your um, wheels and start swapping around, if you did it like I rode every other day, I rode these wheels, you'd be fine, right? But if you ride your 29s for a most majority of your time, and then you go put 27.5s on it, you're going to have skipping issues. Um, you're going to have to adjust your brakes every time you read So does this. that mean you would have a, a maybe swap chains when you do that? Would that be? No, the... what you would do is you want to move your cassette from wheel to wheel. Mm -hmm. so if you're someone that wants to do this you'd also invest in a uh, chain whip and a cassette lock ring tool so that way you can just move your cassette over to your wheel and have this wheel set going on um, most of the time it's not super practical to have another wheel set they're going to be swapping around all the time um, 
typically I think it'd be a situation like Al where he's riding his 29s most of the time. And then, Hey, guess what? We're going to go on this beach ride. Right. I'm going to put that, those, those fatties on there. Yeah, I could see that. I think I've, I haven't done it where I've swapped um, to different wheel sizes, but like I've had the same wheel, like a replacement wheel where I've had to do that. And it, yeah, it's not as quick, but if it becomes like this big upcoming trip you're doing or something. I think a more practical thing that a lot of adventure cyclists could do and think about is you can use the same bike for multi different kinds of things, right? You can have a mountain bike that you take on road tours. Well, then it's just a matter of swapping your tires, right? Yep. Again, not super fun or convenient if you're doing it all the time. But if you're bike packing, you know, most of your year on dirt tires and you decide I want to go on a road tour, I don't have a road bike. We'll put some road tires on your mountain bike. It's still going to be your comfortable, same old bike. But guess what? It just turned into a Ferrari. It's fast. It rolls fast, right? So swap your tires out and take your mountain bike on a road tour. I think it's a good point to bring up because that's actually what I did on my Marin Pine Mountain when I was getting familiar. And at one point I had quite a bit of different tires just because I wanted to try it out and get an idea. So I had 30, I still have these 30 millimeter inner diameter rims. And so what I did was I looked at a rim chart that told me the the th- the narrowest tire you could put on it and the widest tire you could put on it. And so I, I actually did that. And I got to the point where it's like, oh, if I'm going on a big mountain bike ride, I'll swap to these tires. And if I'm going on mostly pavement, I'll switch, I'll switch to these road tires. And it's gotten to the point, I really like the Terravail t- tires. I don't know, this might not be everyone's experience, but for some reason, they've been the most easy for me to uh, do tubeless in my garage where I can literally swap tires and set them up tubeless. Like I'll, I'll suck out the sealant, put them in the new tires, swap everything, completely change over from mountain bike tires to road tires on the same wheels, probably in 30 minutes in my garage. Well, tubeless tires are getting better and better as it goes on. The, um, the, the bead quality of the bead on the tire and the quality of the bead and the quality of your rim makes the big difference. But tires are getting better and better to make it so you could do it that way. Tubeless tires, people have horror stories, right? Of, oh, I spent 16 hours in my garage last night trying to set my tubeless tire up. And it's not hard like that. You know, it's usually some kind of issue or something. But um, I, have t- I have the same rims on both of my bikes. I have them on my road bike and my mountain bike. The same 30 millimeter rims, same exact ones. And on my road bike, I have 40, 700 by 42s. And on my mountain bike, I got 29 by 2.35s. And both the bikes, they perform, both bikes, the tire performs great on those rims. Yeah, I think it's a good point to also bring up the whole, tu- the whole thing about tubeless. Uh, some people don't understand when they get into, I think it's more common, especially now when we talk about these bike packing category bikes you'll see a lot of them with tubeless compatibility. And I know when I first was thinking about it, not having any idea how the mechanics or how all of that works, and and then also talking to other people now that don't understand it, and I'm trying to tell them um, about the tubeless setup, and I've had some people tell me, oh, I would never do that because they, they don't really understand uh, how it compares to tubes because they'll say stuff like, well, wh- what if you get a hole in your tire? Then what are you going to do? But if you get a hole in your tire, you're screwed. Even if you have tubes, that doesn't really, you know, make a, make a difference there. Most people, in my opinion, that are like, um, t- doubt tubeless or talk down to it or whatever. Um, they, they lean towards only listening to the horror stories of people's tubeless experiences. And, and, and that being said too, I mean, you're listening to them on the internet, right? So everybody just talks shit on the internet all day. Who cares what the internet says? Try it for yourself. I'm tubeless for life, son. Like, if I can have every one of my bikes tubeless, they'd, every one of them would be tubeless. Tell me one reason why you would not. Oh, you're still going to bring a tube with you. Yeah, I've been, I've been carrying a tube with me in my pack for fucking, you know, three years in my frame bag and haven't used it. I, I remember having so many, and I'm sure tons of bike commuters out there, if they're listening to this, I remember having so many flats. And whenever you have a flat with tubes, it's just a pain in the ass. And all I remember is when I switched to tubeless, I've never once over the last four years had a flat. I maybe had one time where I, you know, got a hole in the tire and I hear it and it's spraying the sealant and then it seals up. And that was that. So, I mean, when you talk about the headache of a flat, it's gone away entirely. Well, and also too, tubeless is not just benefiting for getting flat tires. Um, 
yeah, you get less flat tires for sure, but you typically get a better handling feel. Um, when you when you blow up your tube in your tire, it's round, right? It's just trying to keep your tire round. So when you're riding, your tire is trying to stay round as it can all the time. Well, on tubeless, when you lean into a turn, your tire can kind of flex on the rim, keeping your traction, keeping your tread on the ground, right? It's not just going to want to do this thing. So you get a better ride feel. You can also have it at lower tire pressure. You probably have lower tire pressure because you are not worrying about pinch flats. And you have a better system on how a tubeless tire and a rim, the bead locks, right? Um, but I mean, I'm amazed by tubeless tires. I have been on rides and Al will vouch for this. I mean, we stuck four plugs in a tire in That's one nice. hole. Yeah, one hole, four plugs. Yeah. Yeah. Guy we were with got a hole. We're fucking, you know, 12 miles up some <laughs> dirt road or something. And he gets a hole and Oh shit. I pulled out my, you know, I, I carry a um, Dyna plug made in Chico, California and put four plugs in that thing and filled it up and boom, we were back on the trail. We rode another 18 and a half miles. Came wrong the thing in the next day and it was fun to look at, right? And look at all of the, the plugs all lined up. Plugs work. Uh, I think it's works better. I think the plugs are more, um, they work more times than when you try to patch your own tube. People always patch their tubes and have problems with them. You get you air it up and you're flat, you know, half a mile down the road. There was one time I do remember um, I w- did a long bike ride out to Oak Ridge. And I think that was actually the one time where it wasn't sealing as much on my tubeless setup. And I'm trying to remember exactly. I might have forgotten my repair kit or I didn't have my plugs with me. And so I kid you not, I remember finding a twig that I could use to shove a bunch of grass into it and and plug it up so the smaller you make the hole the sealant can work better right most people's problem with tubeless having that haven't seal up the two common problems you hear about tubeless that i hear in my world in the bike shop one is brand new tubeless setups that you know uh, uh not talking about the guy down here um that want to cuss you out when they break their when they take their brand new tubeless setup home and it goes flat the next day because they don't go ride it. Brand new tubeless setup. You put the tubeless in there. That wheel needs to keep spinning, forcing all that sealant out into the tire and sealing everything up. Riding it is good. The second problem is you get a hole. Oh, my God, I can hear my sealant seeping. Out. I can see it squirting. And you have the tire facing up looking at that hole, right? Turn your tire around. Put the hole towards the ground so all that sealant goes to that hole. Plugs it up instead of looking at it, right? But no, I mean, and you think about this, how many flats are you getting or how many punctures are you getting that you don't even know about because the sealant did its job, right. which would which every one of those would have been used on the side of the road, patching a tube or putting a new tube in or something. So we talked, we talked about carrying an extra tube and I want to be as self-sufficient as I could possibly be. And I actually carry a tube, but the only time I used it was when somebody tore their t- sidewall. You know, yeah. and uh, when you had like three quarters of an inch of torn sidewall, um, sealant's not going to be able to solve that one. Um, yeah. So we put a tube in that one. And so even at that, we rode another 15 miles or so to get home. Yeah, we, we all usually have an emergency minimal kind of tube in our kit, like just in case. I've still never had to use mine either. And when you're bike packing with your friends, remember this. 27.5 fits in 29. Put the tube in the tire. 29 fits in 27.5. 26, you can put in 29. I mean, it's not going to last very long, but it'll get you there. So you can put multiple tube sizes in different t- size tires to get, you know, your buddy rolling or yourself rolling. Emergency um, fix, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, tubeless comes with a price. Tubeless tires are more expensive. Tubeless rims are more expensive. You got to buy a valve. You got to buy special tubeless tape. You got to buy tubeless sealant that you got to refresh once in a while. Another thing that people don't do all the time. And a plug kit. You could buy a simple little bacon strip plug kit, like 10 bucks, and it's going to do the job. You can buy Dyna plugs, you know, 40, 50, 60 bucks, whatever they cost. They're more expensive, and you got to refill the little Dyna plugs. So tubeless can be more expensive for the initial setup, but over a long period of time, you probably are evening out on, um, buying tubes especially people that have to take their bike to the bike shops right to put a tube change in now you got labor and a tube involved yeah so i would say when you're buying a stock bike i think this is probably how 
uh, mine came is I think usually when you get it stock, they, they might, the shop might set it up tubeless or it might come with tubes, but, but the specs will say that the rims and everything are tubeless compatible. And I think that's what you'd probably want as a baseline is just to make sure you're getting something that's compatible with it. If you think you might be uh, in the future leaning in that direction. Yeah. So stock bikes, most of the time today would come as um, either not tubeless compatible or tubeless compatible. Now, if it's tubeless compatible, it would be a combination of it has a tubeless rim, it has a tubeless tire, but it has a tube put in there with or without tubeless tape, right? Or it can be where it's just a tubeless compatible rim and you would then have to go buy a tubeless tire and a tubeless tape and valve. Most bicycle shops would set up a, um, what we would say a real mountain bike, higher end mountain bike, someone that's gonna definitely be just riding trail. If it came tubeless compatible, we would set it up tubeless, right? If it's a uh, mid-range mountain bike or a hybrid or touring bike or something like that, and it was not, and it was a brand new bike and it was tubeless compatible, we pro- it, it probably comes with tubes and we probably still set it up with tubes, right? Because um, in the bike shop world, you know, time is money and it's a whole nother process now to set this bike as a tubeless. And so at the person that buys that bike at a level of um, say, you know, six, seven, eight hundred dollars typically is going to roll a tube versus the guy that's buying the three thousand dollar mountain bike, which, you know, he's going to go mountain bike the heck out of it. So at this point, it sounds like uh, we've covered the topic of wheels and tires. Um, One thing we can say when it comes to width is, you know, right now, like I said, the width I've landed on mine, I'm doing 29ers that are 2.5 inch. Mike, you said 2.35. And what width are you going with with your 29 inch tires, Al? I'll probably go and aim for uh, 2.35, maybe 2.4. So like on on our bikes um, or my bike and how um, Al's doing his bike versus your bike, Dallas, um, all 29s, right? Uh, all mountain bike tires. And we all kind of have that, that that style of mountain bike tire where you're getting a very consistent tread down the center. So you can still ride good pedaling, but you have side knob to get bite. Now, the difference is um, we're running a little bit smaller tire and a little bit narrower of a rim. I think you probably have a 35 millimeter internal tire on your salsa. Uh, no, mine, mine's 30 KOM. Okay, well then I take it back. We're all running basically the same size rim with two different size tires. And, and we're talking, you know, once we're talking between 0.35 and 0.5, that's 0.15 inches across the whole thing. So on either side, that's like... It's a pretty good amount. I mean, it's noticeable. You put your tire to my tire and you can notice yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think people also do will take tire size um, way too critical, right? Um, you know what? I just put a new tire on my bike. Same exact tire. I mean, the same exact tire. And the old ones are wider because over time, a tire will kind of expand. Now, right now, I have two 2.35s. One's a little bit wider than the other one. Do I notice it? No. And wouldn't you say that our wheels, everything we're talking about, I would kind of say that that's kind of a cross-country mountain bike tire wheel kind of setup, right? A 30 millimeter rim on a mountain bike today, um, on today's kind of bike industry standard, a 30 millimeter rim with like a 2.35 is definitely going to be leaning towards a cross-country mountain bike. Most mountain bike tires I'm selling here in the shop for Whiskey Run Trails and Bandon, I'm selling two fours to two sixes maxis mostly uh knobby tires right yeah yeah so i think about that sometimes like man what if i was riding up you know this 35 mile route today with a two six right oh god yeah yeah and i've kind of thought that uh cross country is kind of a good it's probably a good starting point because isn't that kind of cross country is a mixed terrain kind of well, cross country is kind of like mountain biking without launching big jumps. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, you're still riding single track trail. You're still bombing down trail. You're still doing stuff. It's just not as aggressive, not a bunch of big airtime. You know, when I was probably a late teenager, early 20s, I would have never bought a cross country mountain bike. I've been like, nah, 
now I'm getting big travel, you know, big tires, all this stuff. And then now as a 35 year old, I'm like, yeah, that's cool. I really like that stuff, but I'll do that. You know, when I do that, but I mostly would lean towards buying like a hard tail, you know, if I had front suspension to be a shorter travel front fork, because I want to go take in the woods and go mountain biking, but I'm mostly going to be trying to pedal out to explore and that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 For me, I mean, um, talking tire, tire width and tire construction is if it matches the terrain and your ability, you're probably in good shape. Uh, you might be able to ride tougher, more gnarly technical terrain, but if your tire doesn't match that, then you're going to be in trouble. Uh, same, same going to, you know, a big old fat three inch tire might be the perfect thing for the trails, but it's just not designed to ride. 30, 35 miles carrying your gear out on gravel roads. It's just, it just yeah. not a good fit. And no, like, another uh, thing to add to that, um, when you're looking at tires and you're buying tires, most mountain bike tires today will make the same tire in a like lighter, racier version and a yeah. more durable, hard version, right? Now, if you're the mountain biker and you're racing and you're competition racing or something, you go as light as possible. You know, you're not out there trying to survive on it. You're trying to like be faster, right? So you want a light, fast tire. But in a bike packing situation, you'd probably want to lean more towards the heavier duty tire, the Dura skin or the Armadillo or whatever you want to call it. That's a little bit thicker sometimes, a little heavier duty rubber, but the um, the knobs are not so sticky. So when you're riding down the road, you're not just wearing your tire out, you know, trying to push against the pavement. It's going to roll a little faster. It's yeah, it's the darn thing is, um, is it the right tire for what you're doing? That I mean, it really comes down to that and comfort level, right? I'm going to be out in the woods. I don't want to be stranded out in the woods. I want to have something yeah. that's going to get me there, going to get me back. It's kind of like um, hiking in high heels. You know, you might look sexy as hell, but if it's not suited for it, you're going to have a long, terrible trip. OK, put on those hiking boots and get out there and explore some and try different tires. I mean, come on. The tire is going to wear out and you're going to go to a different tire, right? And you can keep buying the same tire and be settled with it. And most people do that. They like, they find a tire they like and they just stay with it, right? Um, I go through all kinds of tires because I'm always looking for tires that are on sale or something like that. Like, I don't care as long as it's the right size and it's cool. And, and I find some I like and I find some I don't like. Um, but try different tires. You know, it's like grips. If you're going to wear them out. Try something different. And don't give up on the tire too soon. Every time I've swapped tires, it was a horrible mistake for about two weeks. And then I kind of got comfortable riding them. And it was like, oh, hey, this is a great tire. Yeah, uh, Al's, Al's bouncing off of every dirt road we go to and like having a hard time keeping on the dirt roads when we're bombing stuff when he was on the um, Surly Extraterrestrials, which are like an all-terrain tire that's more of a road, less of a mountain tire. And so I put him on these, uh, yeah, I put him on, well, he's also, I don't know, like rock hard. Um, yeah, like a so, roadie. I put them on these Maxis, um, can't remember what they are, but they have a consistent tread down the center and kind of side knobs. And I get them all set up and we go out and meet like a few days later for a ride. And typical Al, they're tubeless and he didn't even like ride it for the first two days or something. And we get out on this ride and he's bitching and complaining. And, you know, what the fuck? These tires suck. And I look they over suck. and he's on like 10 pounds of pressure on his tire in the back. Just rrr, rrr, rrr. like, dude, air these things up and let's get rolling. And he's been on them ever since, like a year yeah. later. Been about a year and I haven't had a flat. And about every month and a half, I put a little bit of air pressure in it. Man, it's great. I haven't changed the fluid. I mean, I broke all the rules and it's still a great tire. You should bring it in for a, a restands. It's a good idea. I've seen, uh, you know, some people doing, whether it's a bike packing race or just testing their abilities. There has been this term over biking that I've seen where where some people are uh, really trying to let's say you're trying to do a race and you're probably not going to win, but you might be the person that did it the fastest time with a fat bike or something like that. So I've seen some people where they do over bike, they over overdo it on the tire size or whatever. And so there might be sometimes when you're riding something like that, like a tire that doesn't really meet the purpose. And you're really going to get a workout like maybe you're thinking of it that way. But one thing I think that we've learned over time and and reasoning be behind getting something that is a little bit faster when you're doing this type of riding is when you have all day. Sure, you're getting training, you're getting a workout, especially when you're riding a mountain bike and it's a lot of pavement. But 
even the littlest change in the, the tread on your tire and things like that, when you're talking about going all day, think about how much further you could end up getting just because of something that simple, right? So you might not be trying to race, but if you have all day, um, you're, you're going to get a further distance just because of maybe the tire you're using. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, we do rides sometimes with mountain bikes and 700Cs, right? Or we go back and do the same route we did on our mountain bikes on our 700C road kind of gravel bikes, still bomb the same hill. You know, I don't, maybe don't go as fast, maybe don't go as crazy or something like that, but you still do it. So if you're looking at tire size and you go, and you're the kind of person that wants to overbike it, or I want to get this big old knobby tire, remember that big old knobby tire is going to only work for, better for those times where that comes into play. In a general adventure type of riding, going a little smaller size on the tire is probably going to benefit you. Oh, no, I'm not going to go, you know, a 2.35 on my bike instead of a 2.6. But your buddy's riding you with a 700 by 45. It's going to work. You're going to work. Um, so in adventure cycling, you want to find that perfect size tire and that perfect amount of knobbiness that you can handle all situations, but not take away from any situations. I want to ride fast on the road. I want to ride fast on gravel. I want to come in hot in a turn and know that I can get leaning on my tires and I got knobbies. I went for a ride a long time ago without climbed to the top of this big old peak, hung out, came down. It's like an eight mile downhill and it's steep. I mean, some of the steepest actual gravel roads that I've been on really steep. The road kind of crowns in the center, right? Crowns in the center. And there's like a ditch on the sides. We come in hot. I start to veer off towards the outside of the trail and I'm like, get that feeling where, you know, you're going to crash, you know, like I'm, I'm out of control and I'm trying to pick my spot. It's tr like trees, 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 trees. And I'm like, there's gotta, I, I gotta get into some grass or get into something cause I can crash and not, you know, slam a tree. But you know what? I was halfway between, I'm still trusting my tires, but I'm planning to crash and my tires pulled through and I made it out and it didn't crash. So you start to find a tire that's good and works for you. You build a lot more trust in it, which makes you a better cyclist because you're not getting on the brakes scared because you can trust your tires. Yeah. Yeah. You want to be confident, especially when you're riding. Yeah. All sorts of stuff in all conditions through all the seasons. Once stuff gets wet or there's leaves on it or, you know, things get slick, like you do want to feel confident on your tires. Yeah. I was going to say, we talked about um, basically our, our bikes and our tires um and i talk about you know riding the same same route on my mountain bike or on what i call my gravel bike which is um a sort of straggler um that big difference that i can ride the same route on both bikes but there it's a totally different ride because of the gearing the the geometry of the bike you know i could probably set up and uh bike camp with the straggler my my gravel bike and be fine it just i don't feel as comfortable with the geometry uh and i don't feel it's as bulletproof as the karate monkey um yeah. but but there are places i would not be comfortable riding on the gravel bike because it's a 42 chain ring and i'm riding a 30 on the gravel bike i'm not fast on the i'm on, i mean on the karate monkey i'm not fast on the karate monkey but i can climb hills and we have plenty of hills and every hill gets steeper once you put 30 pounds of, of a camping gear on your bike. Yeah. So, and that's kind of a thing that we've been going through, right? Is me and I'll both have um, kind of very similar drivetrains on, on both of our bikes. Um, but on our road bikes, they're almost exactly the same. And they both have, you know, 10 by 50 tooth Eagle cassettes and 40 tooth rears. And we go, oh, that'd be fine. You know, it's a, it's a road bike and it's narrow tires. We can climb hills on 40 tooth. And then we go on these hills that we normally climb on our mountain bikes <laughs> on a 42. And I'm like, God damn, dude, I'm having to work to ride yeah. this bike. And I feel like I'm working harder on the road bike. Right. And I go, God, man, that sucked. That was a sucky ride. Like that shit sucked. You know, sorry to make you wait because I'm on this stupid 42 <laughs> climbing hills. And then I look at Strava and I'm actually faster yeah. on the road bike climbing hills on the 42, but definitely feeling like I'm working harder. Right. Yeah. The next topic we can jump into, I think we've definitely covered wheels, tires, all that good stuff. We talked about uh, the current bikepacking rigs that we're using. 
Um, even talked a little bit about the fact that, you know, I'm still building my all road bike, but we, we both, we all have kind of a mountain bike style bikepacking bike. And, uh, we've all started to have these gravel bikes as well. And we're just kind of having fun with that. Those are two, they make the ride different. Like I was just saying, um, you definitely don't necessarily need to have two bikes. I think originally, you know, especially when I was thinking about my first bike, I was all about, I want one bike to kind of do everything I'm doing. And that's a great starting point, a great place to learn. And over time, you might find the reason why, oh, I might want a, another bike for this specific use case or, or reason. And so it does depend on your price point. You know, I think when people are first getting into this, they might have a bike, uh, the, the bike they already have, and just finding ways to make some upgrades to that bike or just um, see how they can attach bags to it and everything like that. I know some of the entry level or, or cheaper bikepacking bikes in the category, like I mentioned, the Marin Pine Mountain is usually pretty budget friendly. Um, there's the Salsa Range Finder that just came out recently. Um, so usually these different brands will have something that it can kind of fit uh, your budget. Um, but when you look at these different bikes, they do come in different uh, frame materials. So there's, you know, the more expensive and more lightweight titanium. Um, there's the m probably most common aluminum. Um, when it comes to bikepacking bikes, though, I think a lot of us like steel. And there's a lot of reasons behind that. It can kind of be very cost effective and durable, but also, um, like Mike said earlier, you know, it can kind of be a little bit flexible and, and give just in the right way when you're um, doing some rowdy, bump, bump, bumpy stuff. Did I miss another uh, material? Well, carbon there's car fiber. carbon fiber, yeah, carbon aluminum, fiber. and yep. steel, right? Chromoly. So typically what you see in the adventure cycling type of bikes, uh, bike packing bikes, touring bikes, you're going to see more steel stuff. Steel is a soft ride, um, and it can carry a lot of weight. It's easily, they can easily add uh, mounts, you know, uh, multiple water ball cages, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, aluminum bikes typically ride the most rigid, and then a carbon bike. Now, some people are scared of taking a carbon bike bike packing, right? Multiple reasons. One is, is it is strong? Is it going to last? Is it going to break on me? da da da, da. Carbon fiber is super strong, right? Uh, a steel frame, you might say you hit it like in the perfect spot on a rock or something. You can dent a steel frame, an aluminum frame, and then the carbon will actually kind of take the impact and come back. But then at a certain point, on the other side of the spectrum is, you want me to go strap a frame bag to my $3,000 carbon frame and, you know, get dirt in between it and rub dirt on the stuff and, and just, you know, take away the clear coat and, you know, and, and potentially ruin your frame. So it depends on what you're doing. Everything comes down to what you're doing. If you're the ultra endurance cyclist getting ready to race across America, right? You're probably gonna be on a carbon bike, light as possible, fast, right? If you want, this is my one bike. I'm gonna buy one bike, it's gonna be my everything bike. I'm gonna take it bike packing. I'm gonna ride it with my friends at the park. I'm gonna commute it. You probably would be better off leaning towards a steel bike. Steel bike's a little bit cheaper, and it's forever strong. I mean, it's going to last a long, 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 long time. Remember steel. Steel, the one material to rule them all. Yeah, steel is real, right? Anyone hear something funny? I was in a bike shop years ago, and there was an older mechanic that worked there, and a great guy, great cyclist. And uh, people would say, steel is real, man. And he'd say, yeah, real corrosive, because he was a carbon fiber kind of guy, right? <laughs> I, I think one thing I remember when I picked a steel frame, I was looking into it. Steel seemed great because it was uh, fairly reasonably priced. Um, it's also because it's so strong, it usually seems like the tubing can be smaller than like I've seen carbon frames. They kind of actually look bigger because of the the carbon frame is made in such a way to make the bike strong and light. Right. Yeah. So when people don't really know about carbon bikes, but carbon frames are like hundreds of pieces of lay of carbon to make this bike strong and light, right? Well, steel is strong in itself the way the tube is. And when you weld it into a triangle, it gets even stronger. So you can still have this little skinny tube and I have a bike right here. That's a, I'm building that bike up as a custom kind of bike touring bike. It's a 90s GT steel mountain bike, right? 
Another cool thing about steel bikes, 90 or bike packing bikes, 90s mountain bikes. Any bike from the 90s that had a steel frame and a fork, typically you could just like change the V-brake, put take the cantilever brakes off, put some V-brakes on it, put a make, make it a one by drivetrain, put a cool riser handlebar on it, and you're making this whole new bike out of a bike that was already from before. So there's mountain bikes, and there's road bikes, gravel bikes, there's 90s steel mountain bikes you can turn into like all-terrain bikes all day long right we're going bike packing today's wednesday we're going bike packing on saturday and we're kind of doing our shorter version on the road i'm going to take my shot bike which is a 90 steel frame with a crust clydesdale crate fork on it and i'm super excited about that because it's a great bike i'm riding it home tonight so um what else can you take bike packing besides mountain bikes road bikes 90 steel bikes how about cargo bikes yep that's a that's a big thing today there's more and more cargo bikes right who cares about speed it's all about what can i take with me right what can i yeah. pick up along the way you might have even been taking your dog with you you know so imagine on our bikes halfway through the ride if you had to pick up a whole meal to carry with you it'd be kind of a bitch right yeah yeah you'd be tying shit on the top on the outside get a cargo bike who cares Throw it in the front. Throw I'm it in the back. That, I think in that uh, that cargo bike and that surly uh, in in the shop there, that would be the ultimate. Yeah, the big I easy. Just need, I just need enough batteries just to you know keep going day after day. Well, the cool but, thing about the big easy we got here is you can actually wire it to have two batteries. So Bosch system, two batteries, like a sixty-five mile range or something. Yeah. Maybe, maybe um, maybe speaking of electric days. bikes, um, we have a customer here. Um, great customer who lives in coos bay he rides an electric bike right he is very inspired by our videos because we just are trying to tell people to get out there and have fun yeah and so he hit me up and he said hey i want to go bike pack in on my electric bike what do i need to do let's do it and so he's not going to go out there and go you know 100 miles this weekend he's going to go in the range of his battery so we looked at his bike. What are we going to do? We could set it up with racks. We could set it up with bike packing bags. Da, 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 da. And he's going to get himself bike packing this summer over to the local state parks. So Which, electric bike, go bike packing, right? Cargo bikes, road bikes, gravel bikes, mountain bikes. And we whatever you got. A, we should do a simple overnight or band into uh, Blanco. That's within his battery's range. Charge it up overnight. Yeah, yeah. And back. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. You could take a trike if you wanted to. Imagine taking a trike. <laughs> it was a short ride, and it was like not a bunch of uphills or nothing. I would take a trike. Load it up. Put a trailer on the back. Oh, man. I'm rolling. I see cycle tourists on, you know, a Walmart mountain bike. Yeah. But that's just what they got, and that's what they're doing it with. And here they are riding a 1,000 miles is, or something. The thing is, they started with a really low-end bike, added what they needed to it, right? And they're making it work. Would it be easier if they put more money into it and had uh, more bike with more mounts and better gear? Probably. But you know what? They're still doing it. And the adventure for them is maybe higher because they're doing it on a, a low-end bike. You know, So yeah. you can't really dictate what works for me is going to work for you. But usually yep. people gravitate towards what's easiest. And a bike that's comfortable and set up well will be easier for you to ride. So you'd be more comfortable longer. And you'll, you'll probably enjoy it longer. So how do you be comfortable on the bike? What makes your bike comfortable? Right. Handlebars, a lot of it. grips, the handlebars, saddles, yeah. pedals. Yeah, before we jump into handlebars, the last thing I just wanted to say with the frame material is, again, with steel, we know if you're adventuring on it, and there's people that are doing bikepacking across the world, traversing crazy stuff. I've seen them in other countries where if somehow the steel breaks, which is very rare, you can even find somewhere and weld it probably every country in the world i'm not gonna say everyone but most countries that people are cycle touring in um if you had a steel frame and it broke you can get it welded for the most part and you're gonna make it might be ugly you know all the bike manufacturers say nope don't ride it you know scrap that bike uh, same with aluminum aluminum is a little different it's probably gonna last longer being a steel bike but if you have a carbon bike and you're you know and you break your frame you're you know Done. You're not going to be fixing it on the road. They make, you know, at home carbon fixing kits and stuff, but, you know, major problem. Yeah. Yeah. It, you, I've heard of people taking it to, back to the, you know, like the carbon frame 
a manufacturing facility where they they can rebake it or something like that. But it definitely is way more complicated to fix something like that to the point where you can trust writing it again and not well like having an issue. There's real professional fixing. Um, I've sent frames off to, for example, Calfee Designs. Uh, broken carbon frame, most people throw away, can't buy it no more. Sentimental value, whatever the reason what is, the person gets it fixed. And they send it back and it literally... You cannot tell it's ever been broken and you can trust it. It's, it's, it's fixed. Wow. Yeah. But big time money, big time issue, you know? Uh, what's your thought before we move on? Last thing about frame material. What's your thoughts on titanium? Uh, titanium is great. Titanium super strong, super light. Um, the, probably the biggest drawback to titanium is the price. It's expensive. Yeah. And, you know, me personally, I have a titanium fat bike coming. Um, kind of a custom bike deal going and it's an opportunity that I'm getting to get this bike. Would I go out of my way and buy a titanium frame? Probably not because it's really expensive, but it's super cool at the same time. Yeah. Titanium bikes look really cool. But when you're at the end of the day, if you're comparing two and you're just like the only difference between these two is that titanium. And at the same time, I think I have this idea that titanium is super lightweight and it is, and it is, but once you have the, all the components on it, those are add to the total weight. And so soon it's like, what are we talking about? Just a couple pound difference. I mean, w when you build a custom bike, um, a friend of ours, John has a, I built him last year, year before a custom titanium kind of touring style bike. You know, it's, it's a really light bike, but then it has a pinion 18 speed gearbox on it, yeah. which that itself is kind of heavy. Right. So you can't quite tell the difference. Like, oh, it seems like it should be lighter than it is. Um, but if you went out and you say, I'm going to build a light bike, but um, I don't, I want metal, right? I have this thing where like, maybe I don't trust carbon plastic or something. I want metal. You would go with titanium, lightweight frame. You would then also buy really lightweight parts, yeah. lightweight wheels, you know, components to have a really lightweight, fast bike. We, uh, we have the Tour de France here uh, in our area century kind of yeah. ride and uh last year al rode with a lady with a really nice titanium road bike and i'll tell you why i liked her bike it's kind of an underground rule in the bike industry or bike scene you don't paint titanium well she had a custom floral like flower paint job done on her titanium frame and it looks super cool yeah matching pink hubs and stuff i tell you here's the here's my thing about titanium bikes if i owned a titanium bike I would be less willing to like stop, get over, lay it over on the ground, you know, to go take a leak or, or just, Hey, I'm going to well, just throw this up against a tree and, and take a picture of it. You know, like our, like, karate oh, monkeys. Titanium. our karate monkey is at the end of the ride. We're just like, ah, oh, fuck it. Throw it in the back of the truck. They're all piled up back there. Who gives a shit? Right. Going through bushes and crap, like using your bike to push through blackberry bushes. Oh man. Right? Imagine you had a carbon fiber bike that costs you grip and you're like, Oh, we got to go 300 yards through blackberry bushes. It's all right. I'll put my bike and we'll, we'll, we'll plow yeah. the path. Oh, man. See, I, I, that's where, you know, I mean, if money was no option truly for you, that would be the way to go. But I don't know. I, I'm not there. You know, I know my, that steel bike is a, it's a force of nature. So, you know, it can deal with the blackberries. Dude, if money was no option, screw bike pack and I'd have a $100,000 motorhome. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be laughing at you guys. <laughs> You'd be riding. I remember when I you first got this adventure bike, when you go down this road and you have this, this mindset about an adventure bike, if you're, if you're looking for a bike for bike packing and doing what we're all the stuff we're talking about. Yeah. You, maybe you spend a lot of money and get a really expensive one. Everyone has this feeling where you, you have your brand new bike and you just got it, but you have to get over that um, feeling of not wanting to scratch it or anything. Because if you have that anxiety of scratching it, you're never going to take it anywhere. And so, you know, you have you definitely have to get over that and be like, hey, I'm going to be taking this thing through the ringer because that's what I got it for. And so if you are getting a bike that you're going to spend so much money on where you're going to be scared to even get a scratch on it, that's probably not the right bike for uh, the kind of riding we're talking about, because we're talking about hike a biking and going all over the place where you're probably going to up a few things but also too you know when you take cycling as your passion or your sport like a race car driver or motorcycle racer you just make you just understand like yes i'm gonna buy this high-end titanium bike and i'm gonna scratch it 
it's going to happen, right? So I'm still going to do it, right? But there is that special time when you bought that brand new bike and you finally get a first good scratch on it. And then, in my opinion, you really get to enjoy that bike from now on, right? But think about this. When you get that brand new bike, the bike manufacturer or the bike mechanic built it already scratched it. Somewhere. So. Yeah, you're looking for it. Where would they scratch yeah. this thing? Yeah. Cool. So I think we covered frame material. We talked about a few, you know, stock bikes that are out there. Any other stock bikes that come to your mind? Um, you know, one that's. Uh, the Pine Mountain Marin, Surly Karate Bunkies, numerous salsas. Um, I can't remember all the models, but all city, you know, good stock awesome. bikes. Uh, now, like Trek Specialized are starting to do, you know, like one bike in their whole huge lineup of like an adventure bike, right? What else? Bomb Track makes super cool ones. Tumbleweed. I have uh, one buddy that um, wanted a bike packing bike, and I know you're about to finish it. That's Surly Krampus. That was one that we landed on for him, and that's been a great one. Yeah, and that's been a really fun one, and it's great for the starter pack, actually. I wish it was done so I can show you right here. Um, you know, I have people that go, I want to build a bike, and there's really no limit on how much it's going to cost. You know, this is their one time build of their life where they're going to go all out and, you know, they're going to get an $8,000 bike or something. And then I have other people like your friend that was like, I got this much money and I want to have a sick bike and I'm not a pro. I'm not a, not even an avid cyclist. I just want to start doing this stuff. Right. And I got this much money. What can we do? And I, I know I want this Surly Krampus. Right. Yeah. And so, okay, we got a Surly Krampus frame and fork. And then we, I sat down and helped him figure out like, okay, we want to, you know, we want a cool bike, but we don't want, we want to spend what he can spend. Right. And so for me on the bike shop side, that's kind of fun because it's really easy to build a bike when there's no price limit. Sure. I'll build the sickest bike we can ever think of. There's no price limit. It's easy. Right. Half an hour later, we got a whole bike built, you know, 10 grand or something on his bike. It was like, okay, I got to figure this out. We want to get good hubs, but not super expensive hubs. We want good tires, but not super expensive tires, right? And we have a super cool looking Surly back there that's going to be a great bike. I can't wait for him to go bikepacking with us on his custom Surly Krampus. Shout out to Adam. He should have a Surly Krampus ready soon. But yeah, I mean, that, and that is a bike that uh, in some ways almost started the bikepacking category. It was a bike that a lot of people started using. I mean, don't quote me on this. But I think it started the plus size category of bikes, right? And I actually had a Krampus at one point in my life. Um, I personally didn't like it because I think I lean more towards the I'm going to ride more gravel road and less like backcountry, you know, plus size tire type of stuff. But um, his bike looks really cool. It's got this whole like uh, green and brown kind of World War II military bomber plane thing going on. Yeah. And when you talk about the the Krampus is one of those bikes when we talk about forward compatibility, because that's something, you know, I would usually recommend is it can fit if you want to go 29 plus. Like Mike said, it was one of the first bikes to fit like these plus tires, which uh, a while back, a lot of bike packers uh, were using for doing all this, you know, cross country stuff when they're going on all these different terrains. And so it can fit the biggest tires you'd probably want to use like a 29 by three yeah and but that means you can always go smaller it just means it's capable of, of doing that so his bike we're setting up 29 2.5 and i mean it looks freaking sweet like it's gonna be such a cool bike and again I, I said it before but it's really fun you would think that a bike shop person just wants to go out there and blow their wad on a huge expensive bike right it was really fun to build his bike at a normal person price. He got a completely custom built, like I'm talking out the door, completely yeah. custom out the door, Surly Krampus for three under 3000 bucks. I mean, yes, to people that don't think anything bicycle, three grand for a bike, that's expensive. But on the level of mountain bikes, that is for a custom mountain bike. That is, I mean, come on, like. It's a great deal. Great bike. Yeah. And over time, you know, I'm sure your shop on your website and everything, the plan would be to showcase some of these custom builds. Um, 
you know, there you have a lot of fun with it. I know I'm working on that Surly Midnight Special still, um, and I'll be excited when we can show that one off. But these are all perfect examples of here was what they wanted. You know, you talk about like helping people with the cycling experience they imagine, right? They come to you with this idea and you're just having fun along the way, helping them make that a reality. It's, it's super fun. Um, at this stage in my bike career, you know, it's been band and bicycle works. The whole idea was this is not a shop that's here to just like, Oh, I'm here to produce bikes and, and, and make a killing. Right. I really wanted to be like my, um, my ending of my career. Right. This is the last shop I'm doing. And after this, I'm done. And so I want to have fun with this. I want to be creative and have fun. And so, you know, Al's Karate Monkey was more of a stock build, which we just modified a little bit. But I got to sit down with Al and build a completely custom Surly uh, Straggler gravel bike, which he calls the Gravel Ninja. That's all black. And um, Dallas, we're working on another Surly, a um, Midnight Special 700C drop bar kind of gravel bike um super fun for that one because you know al's bike had a color theme of all black which is easy but dallas's bike has a whole different color theme with actual color so we had to figure out like hey what's gonna work you know and what brand's color shade is the same as this color right so i'm sure there's going to be a video on his bike because it's a really cool one um another friend of ours john we built a custom titanium pinion bike um your friend the krampus so all these bikes, I kind of um, am calling, you know, shop builds, but uh, they don't all make it to the Internet because it's just part of work. Right. We build them. Customer gets it. Hey, have fun. So what we're starting to do is kind of document these bikes and um, in the future, start to bring them to the public's eye to show like this is a custom bike, you know, and how cool it is. It, a little bit of history about why someone chose what components they did. You know, some of them is. Uh price it was like comparable options this was a better price some of them um would be you know this is the gear ratio i i need for me to be comfortable on the bike so that drives part of it you know and some of them are real easy they just have very small stuff that they have standards they're kind of leaving it up to the professional to figure it out like i want to do this type of riding and i might want this color that's like the most basic right i want to ride like this and i want this color and i want it for this price Right. OK, so we want to figure out parts, um, for example, on his buddy Adam's bike is I want parts that are not going to be super expensive, but also not something he's going to have to work on in a year. You know, like I want sealed bearings, on all the hubs. I want, you know, a decent one by 12 drivetrain and stuff that he can get by, but not just total cheap stuff. And so when you bring it to Band and Bicycle Works, for example, I'm kind of thinking about you. Right. I don't want you to, have to work on your bike here. I want you to have a good quality bike. Some other shops or other places, they're going to be thinking more about the the profit margin. If I put really shitty stuff on his bike and sell it for more, then I made more money. But guess what? He's going to have a broke down bike in some months, right? And he's going to go that. on this on the he's going to imagine this bike packing route that he's going to go on in the future, and then get out there and it's going to be fucked up because something broke or something wore out prematurely or whatever.